I'm Sharon Ferris, the Senior Director of Marketing and Communications at Sarah. Welcome to the launch of our Careers and Canadian series of virtual fireside chats. Canada Career Month is the perfect time to showcase the powerful role that career development can play in all areas and at all levels of public policy. Before starting, I'd like to acknowledge the Huron Wendat, Petun, Hedona Shone, Anishinaabe, and Mississauga Anishinaabe of New Credit, who share a special relationship to the territory in which Sarek's office is located in Toronto. I invite you to consider the Indigenous connection, past and present, to the land where you are living. We are grateful to have the opportunity to learn together on these lands today. Our Careers and Canadian series is hosted by Lisa Taylor of Challenge Factory, a recognized future work expert and author of Sarek's Retain and Gain series of playbooks, including most recently, Retain and Gain Career Management for the Public Sector. In addition to its focus on public sector careers, the book also examines how career development contributes to the public good for all peoples in Canada, which is our focus for the next hour. We are absolutely delighted that Lisa has as her first guest today, Alistair McFadden, who served as Deputy Minister of Immigration and Career Training in the government of Saskatchewan. Alistair is now part of the Johnson Shoyama School of Public Policy at the University of Saskatchewan. You are in for a very thought provoking conversation today. But first, I would like to take just a moment to introduce you to Sarek and share some housekeeping notes. Sarek is a charitable organization that focuses on education and research in career counseling and career development in Canada. Our mandates are number one, to promote career development as a priority for public good, and number two, to build career development knowledge, mindsets, and competencies. We fund projects like the Retain and Gain Playbook and run a number of programs, including Connexus, Canada's Career Development Conference, which is happening virtually in January. You can learn more about all of Sarek's work at sarek.ca. Next, a couple of housekeeping notes for today's event. You can interact with Lisa and Alistair and ask your questions or share comments at any time by using the questions function you see on your screen. We'll have dedicated time for Q&A at the end of our session. Also, please note that we will send you the recording in the next day. Now, let me turn it over to Lisa to get our fireside chat underway. Lisa? Great. Well, thank you so much, Sharon. And thanks to Sarek for uh, being the or origin point for Retain and Gain, but also for the sponsor for the series. And Alistair, I'm thrilled that we have this time together for our very cozy fireside chat. Uh, you can see that I took it very literally as we were uh, getting started here with this production. And I'm happy to share the warmth of my fire with you as we go through the next hour together. Terrific. It's great to see you again. So let's get started right off the bat in good career development mode and tell me a story, a short story about your parents and work and about work as you were growing up. So is there a moment that stands out for you when you were aware of what your parents did when they left the house and went to work during the day? I learned um, very early about the power of work uh, to, to influence someone's life trajectory, but also their family. That's one thing that stood out for me. Uh, even the close friendships. Uh, I was born in uh, in Burlington, Ontario. I'm a triplet. Uh, my parents had five kids under age five wow. when my dad was relocated to the province of Saskatchewan. And he was working for a company that was branching westward because they wanted to supply metals for emerging industries, things like potash mining and, and manufacturing out west. I saw how my dad's work life created a rhythm for him. Uh, I also saw what it meant for my mother, who was relatively new to Canada, and she was still trying to find her feet in Toronto before moving to Saskatchewan. Uh, my dad traveled a lot. And I saw how consuming work could be. I saw what the pressures did to a young family. I, I saw that you know they would be professionally surrounded by by coworkers or by clients, but sometimes personally isolated because they weren't near the grandparents or the long-term friends. And it made me think at a very young age uh, about the kind of life that I wanted, the work life specifically, and curious about the kind of path 
that would be necessary to have a good career that offered some options and also a bit of balance. So that's kind of the, the, the early signals that I had about, uh, you know, being thoughtful about a career. It's really interesting. There's lots in that, including the fact that you're a triplet, which I didn't know before. Yeah. Uh, when I was uh, young, when I was, uh, you know, just uh, out of preschool or still in preschool, we also moved because my father relocated, but he relocated to Burlington. So we relocated in other directions. So that's kind of, I know, I know, you never know until you're on these fireside chats where you have all these connections with people. Yeah. So, so let's build on that a little bit and some of your own realization. So tell me about a time when you realized you had a skill or an interest, like Let's talk about childhood Alistair, or teenage Alistair. When was a, a t the first time or a, a, an early time when you realized you had something in you that was a little bit unique and a little bit special and something that you could be recognized for? What, what was it and, uh, and what did you do about it? Okay, so th this one goes way back, actually back to the Burlington days. So I, I love, this is what I found about myself, I love discovering patterns and finding mm -hmm. structure getting things organized to, to flow more smoothly. And, you know, my mom says, I once pulled the towels and the things from a linen closet before refolding and sorting everything again by size and, and by color. And, you know, that's kind of a trendy project for adults these days. People buy books and, and magazines uh, about organizing. There was that Netflix show. Um, you know, it's been trending during this lockdown period in the pandemic because people are spending more time with their stuff. But I was three and, and I noticed patterns and an opportunity to improve and I went after it, you know. So I, I found that consistently throughout my work life. I get really curious about what defines success, what gets in the way, what's frustrating. And I like to try to work with those patterns and, and try to find how to make things work more effectively. So being able to see that and then see how that unfolds over the course of your uh, really illustrious career and a career that uh, has really interesting twists and turns is something that maybe we can turn to now for the next couple of minutes. And for everybody that's joining us, the kind of arc of what we're gonna follow is we're gonna get to know Alistair a little bit more and hear a little bit about his own career story and then switch into talking about, and so what does this mean for all Canadians in the policy lens? So as we're still in the lens focused all about you, Alistair, we know that often careers make the most sense when they're looked at in reverse. When you examine it backwards and you can see where these dots are connected or where the pattern, if you will, uh, actually emerges. So tell us what you're doing right now and then take us back through from the beginning of your career to where you are now. Tell us the story of how you got to where you are now. Okay, great. Well, I right now I'm the the director of uh, one of the two campuses for the Johnson Shoyama Graduate School of Public Policy, and I find myself in that role after about 20 years in government and in nonprofits. And so this is a this is a public policy school. It's it's named after two Canadians who uh, are thought to have defined professionalism in, in public administration. Al Johnson and Tommy Shoyama, they, they worked at a provincial level and they also worked in the federal government. And they brought this strong orientation to nonpartisan research and analysis and clear communication and, and processes for stakeholder engagement, and, and most importantly, what they brought, what kind of defined their reputations, with, were the skills that were needed to execute big ideas. Things like mm -hmm. Medicare, that happened first at a provincial level and then at a national level. These are two people that are attributed with those kinds of changes. Now, the school's got nationwide programs for, for leaders in public administration, including healthcare, but also people who aspire to work in the public sector or do public policy research. So I spend my time with uh, people outside this door, working with others to improve our academic programming and, and the professional development programs that we have, teaching uh, classes and workshops, but it's a professional school. Maybe a little different than some graduate programs, it is specifically aimed at helping people advance towards their career future. So we talk about 
careers in many of our courses. We talk about how you're going to need what you're learning here and apply it in the work. We use a lot of case studies and things. Now, I, I don't know if it was, it's karma for me or if it's just life coming full circle, but I'm arriving back at the University of Saskatchewan and, and it's not at all what I expected when I left. Uh, I, I did a master's in brain and behavioral psychology at this university. And I did an undergraduate degree in biochemistry too. And I didn't know anything about the public sector or, or politics or governments. It was distasteful, frankly. There was no school of public policy in those days either in, in the country. And I think like a lot of people, when I was in post-secondary studies, I was searching for a path. You know, I, there was a turning point late one night and it was, wasn't until grad school, but I was, I was in an MRI lab at one of the hospitals in this city. And I had the privileged access after hours where we could do functional imaging studies with some healthy students. And we were exploring how men and women read maps and how they give directions after they've read the maps. You know, what part of the brain region did you use was, the, was this particular investigation. And it was really neat research. Uh, you know, a bit of evolutionary psychology, biology, a bit of engineering wrapped all together. But what really stands out for me after all of that was a cab home, a cab ride home that I took that night, probably one or two in the morning. And it was the dead of winter, you know, which in this place is 40 below, dead quiet, no bugs, <laughs> but just bone chilling cold. I, I get in a cab and, and the driver asks me what I'm doing leaving the hospital in the middle of the night. And I told him, you know, I was studying how men and women read maps. I was learning how they give directions and, you know, they, what part of the brain they use. And that man laughed at me as he was driving home. And he told me that I was wasting my time. And, and he said, everyone knows that men and women do things differently. What's the point of staying up all night doing something like that? What kind of contribution do you want in your life? You know, I'm wasting my time. Um, what's the point was a, was a key question for me. And it, and it rattled me, actually. It made me wonder, uh, what kind of life do I want? What kind of impact do I want? And I was pretty sure I wasn't going to find it playing in a lab. And I decided that I needed to find a way to take what I'd learned in the sciences and in behavioral psychology and put it to use. And you know, I brought that orientation towards things like statistics and spreadsheets and hypothesis testing, do a great job in a small nonprofit. And I became a supervisor of programs that were aimed at uh, youth and adults who have disabilities. And, and I worked with the staff there to develop evidence uh, that our activities weren't just socially important and meaningful, we wanted to show that they had an impact. And we worked really tires, tirelessly to show the funders that we weren't just soothing their social conscience when they provided funding. We wanted to show them that we could demonstrate a return on investment. And that took some analysis. Calculating how our programs led people from uh, where they were to where they could be, right? Towards gainful employment that generated savings to social programs, that tax dollars that could be reinvested. And, and we were doing really simple math. You know, there was nothing fancy about it. It was an Excel spreadsheet. And, and it changed the way we told our story though. And it changed the way we looked at ourselves on that team. But it also changed the way the, the funders were looking at the costs of our activities. Hmm. Suddenly we were speaking in economic terms and, you know, we found resonance with a bigger audience of, of decision makers. And, you know, it was at one point when uh, I was at a meeting with other nonprofits, uh, some government officials had come to town. They were hosting a meeting and, and they were talking about some new projects that were coming and they needed some partners. And I got to talking with them about this really exciting work we were doing on cost benefit analysis and the impressive return on investment. And one of those people pulled me aside on the coffee break. And, and they told me that's just the kind of information they need. They told me that every year, the government departments and ministries have to make a case for their funding. It's not just the funded agencies. They told me about the treasury board table where the needs of their organization are ranked against other needs across government and the priorities of the governing party, right? The elected people who actually make the decisions. 
they told me that I should join their team. And of course, I, like I said, I didn't know anything about government, but I thought, why not? So I did. And I, and I moved to Regina and, and it was about 15 years when I went from a modest role as an analyst in, in one ministry working in an area of social services to eventually leading labor market development and immigration for the whole province as a deputy minister. And, you know, my job throughout was to provide really objective, non-political analysis, give them some options, give them some recommendations so that the elected decision makers could make choices on behalf of society. And so here I am nearly 20 years later, I'm back in a university environment, this time with a chance to actually help grad students find their path towards a career future. This time with more understanding of, of really what's necessary to match the, the opportunities in the economy or in society, the needs of employers with the talent of a diverse workforce. And it's a really specialized role at this school because it's an opportunity also to transform the public sector, change the way the public service operates by developing the new and the emerging leaders who are already working in, in places like government. So I'm really excited to, to uh, you know, have a chance to reflect on that I, and, uh, and, and share what was not a straight line at all. You're right. It only makes sense in hindsight. <laughs> and it's a great story, I mean, to be able to see that whole arc, but at any point in time, it would have been really hard to be able to predict what would come next. And I, I think that's the nature of careers. And I love the just happenstance, um, you know, occurrence that the aha moment came from a cab driver and, uh, and your ability to reflect and hopefully continue to ask your students now, though, what's the point question. And uh, I know in the work that we've been doing, it's one of the things that um, you know, that I really value in all the interactions that we have, that kind of direct, what's the point, what's the impact, how do we measure it, what are the patterns, uh, right from that three-year-old folding tea towels to, uh, yeah. to where you are now. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think that's terrific. And I think it also really, you know, I think that it's probably very obvious to those that are watching and hopefully giving us some good questions, um, why you're such a terrific guest for the first in this series, that linkage between individual careers and the careers that Canadians navigate through in their own experience and the role that government and public policy and institutions can play. So let's pull on some of those, um, some of those threads and shift to, uh, to talking a little bit about the role of policy and career development. When I was researching retain and gain career management for the public sector, it became clear that there was a real opportunity to expand how career development practitioners think and talk about the work that we do. So like what you experienced when you were talking about cost benefit and ROI and putting economic terms into what you were doing for your program, there's also a real uh, important opportunity for our sector, for career development practitioners to understand how they can be talking with policymakers about the impact and the foresight that our sector can actually provide. We have, we have good tools to be able to help navigate when there's uncertain futures. So I'd like to, um, to talk a little bit about where maybe you've seen in the past a specific opportunity or a conversation or a program that developed differently because there was a careers lens that was taken to it. What where have you been able to see that because you were focused from a careers lens or someone else that you were working with took a careers lens in a topic that may have nothing to do with careers the way we traditionally think about it, uh, different outcomes or different ideas and questions emerged? I can think of all kinds of uh, examples in, in my work life that I've had. Um, you know, some of the benefits that I've noticed about having a career lens in, in public policy are, are really foundational to the work that happens in career services. The, the confidence that you can give a person when they have a sense of identity and, and, and purpose and direction, you know, what that can do for young people, help them be more resilient uh, when they're in school, you know, that, that matters for a lot. Uh, that's a mental health outcome right in in lots of ways but we don't always think about it that way there's the there's the competence that emerges emerges when um, people discover what their gifts are uh, and and they find a way to apply that 
that talent and, and sharpen it, you know, by, by learning more and, and by practicing their craft. The, what I also have seen, though, is the continuity that comes from a career lens. Whether it's an individual who's making progress, now it's not always linear, but you're still the same person, right? And you're, you're making those transitions. And in public policy, the continuity that's necessary when, when governments change, when governments evolve, and the people who are inside, because governments are just a collection of people, right? They, they you know, the, the people inside change, they move in and out and, and manage transitions that career orientation that happens when, when a manager is working with their team to support their growth, that's also part of having a career orientation. But a story that I would share with you, one that was particularly impactful, goes back a few years when I joined a, 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 an executive table for the first time. So I was a, a, an assistant deputy minister. In, in a new organization that was formed in the government of Saskatchewan. And you do see this from time to time, governments get restructured, they rebuild their departments, they pull some apart, they mash some together. So I became part of what was known then as a, as a super ministry, where they took several levers of, of the economic agenda and they put them together. Levers that, you know, in some ways it made sense. They should work together. But what, what I found is we spoke very different languages, yet different areas of focus. And in this one super ministry, uh, a few examples of the people that, that I was working with at the executive table, uh, a person whose job was to lead the uh, agenda for resource development in the province, oil, gas, mining, forestry. You can imagine that sort of the business orientation uh, the transformation that's taking place when prices are up and, and down, the uh, royalties that happen when you're developing natural resources, the, the um, implications for relationships with Indigenous communities and, and, and helping people to benefit from, from job opportunities and economic opportunities. Across the table, someone whose job was to manage economic development, attracting uh, investment to the province. Right, building a narrative that gets people excited about growing their business or moving their business into a place like Saskatchewan. Um, and there I was. My job was Assistant Deputy Minister for Labour Market Development. So my job was a little different from theirs. Uh, I was working with the, 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 the people side of the economic agenda. And I was working uh, alongside others who viewed themselves as generating revenue for government, creating wealth, creating opportunities. And, and I was this brand ambassador for a social policy agenda that some people just didn't trust. They weren't sure it was worth it. And they didn't speak the language. And so when we would have uh, planning discussions, for example, and I would talk about the things that were going on in my ministry, which by the way was everything from literacy programs, you know, helping people to learn to read, to language programs for people who are learning French and English as an additional language, to finishing high school, and uh, you know, apprenticeship and, and higher learning. Uh, and on top of that, all of the employment programs, right, that help people to prepare for work and get jobs and, and keep jobs. I'm talking with, with someone who's, main preoccupation might have been something like pipelines. And I realized, you know, I'm not going to get anywhere trying to convince them, trying to sell them on what's important about the work in, in my division and, and what makes these activities worthy. I need to be able to, to um, reframe what I'm doing and, and transform it into a language that they can relate to. So one of the examples was just simply to talk about in, in pipeline terminology, just play with it a little bit. Because one thing that they knew was that pipelines take sometimes a, a, a raw material through a process of refinement through to the ultimate customer. And, and there's some face validity to, to thinking about labor market development in that way. The customer at the other end is the person who's gonna hire that worker. Right? And if it's a really good match for what they need in their tank, uh, you know they're gonna buy it. 
If there's not enough, we have a problem. If the pipeline is leaking, we have significant challenges. Right? You think about the kinds of consequences that happen when someone is unable to finish high school. Right, the, the, the kinds of supports that are necessary when there's that type of an oil spill. Right, the, the involvement with social services and corrections or justice, the, the emergency rooms the, or healthcare costs that happen because disability is something that's sometimes a cause, but it's also a consequence of people in, in poverty and the, the social determinants of health. So I just I found a way to, to try to convert it and 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 build a, a bit more of a working alliance with my peers by finding a common language. And and because we were all part of this ministry that was focused on the economy, we had to confront some headwinds together. Things like the changing perception and public expectation uh, about resource development. And um, in places like Saskatchewan, where, where much of the electricity comes from burning coal, how are we going to transform ourselves to do something that's uh, not as carbon intensive? Or similarly, in, in things like agriculture, or most of what happens in Saskatchewan that relies on transportation to get to market, right? Most of what happens in this province gets exported. We're very export dependent. So the whole carbon agenda is a, is, was a really big deal, not just for these other assistant deputies, but in labor market development. Yeah. Because jobs are changing and it's happening before our eyes. So, you know, an example that uh, had been coming up was that um, the, the federal government had been talking with the regions that were still burning coal and giving them a timeline for stopping it or, or in our case a massive field experiment to try to capture the carbon from those emissions and pump it into the ground they concentrated and pump it into the ground carbon capture and sequestration and saskatchewan had the biggest field experiment in the world at that time so what we ended up uh, wrestling with is what kind of transformation was necessary to to address kind of a shared interest in in having a strong and stable economy something that gave people confidence that this was a place where you could continue to invest that gave individuals and families the confidence that this was a place to build your future and yet massive changes that created uncertainty about jobs a small town on the border with the united states called coronac where where many of the jobs are associated with mining coal that gets shipped a short distance to a uh, coal burning operation that generates power right those people's mortgages are tied up in government's decisions in the reputation of the industry in that clock that was ticking to get out of coal-fired electricity right? the, the uncertainty the betrayal that people felt when they they staked their lives on on building opportunities there and, and it, it helps to, to illustrate that, that government policy in the end is about people. And we can write laws and regulations, we can make pronouncements, but, but in the end, whether you're talking about what we do on climate change or what we do on, you know, to adapt to disruptive technology or, or a pandemic response, all of those sound bites from decision makers the success of those initiatives is really contingent on the behavior of individuals and helping them to make good choices and supporting them to understand what their options are and giving them the knowledge and the skills and, and the ability to actually see that they've got this, that they can adapt, that they can make change. Right? And, and, and to help people to understand that they're more than their job title. I, and I think that that's one of the biggest changes I've noticed in, in the last 20 years, especially. Um, people tend to, to have this habit of, of foreclosing on every opportunity that's in front of them because they see themselves as part of a particular industry in a particular job. And, and they, they fail to recognize all of the gifts and talents that they bring to that role, what they've offered that industry, what they bring that employer that's actually needed in a whole bunch of places. 
And, and so over time, what you see just emerging in a place like this is, um, well, let's say in, in oil and gas, Ma, um, wells that want, were once producing oil in Saskatchewan, those same wells, those same rigs, those same teams are, are learning how to use that, that same uh, aptitude to source helium. That's not just for party balloons. You know, it's it's an important commodity for health systems, uh, and and for manufacturing, and so that kind of thing is is taking place right now. But you know, imagine those individuals; they would have never predicted that. You know, they, when they were a young person, they what they knew of helium was probably that balloon at the party, right? And and for for generations that have worked in a in a resource sector in a province like Saskatchewan, it's pretty difficult to reimagine yourself stepping outside of of what all of your friends, maybe your your parents, have done forever. There's a few things that you've you know that you've just shared that I want to just put a bit of a a point on. So the first, and I don't know if uh, if those that are following along are having the same kind of aha moment as I am, but often the sector talks about how they wish that there were people in government, quote unquote, that understood career development. And what's so obvious is that there are people in government that understand career development. I mean, clearly, you're one of those people and have been there for the last 20 years, as you say. And so there's a, a couple of assumptions that our sector makes that I think sometimes may actually not serve us well or be limiting. So we need to be reaching out and finding where there are other people that that don't need uh, educating and selling, as you said at the beginning, uh, but instead are, are ready and willing to be partners, even if we, we're speaking different language. And one of the things that you didn't mention all the way through that story is an insistence on people understanding what career development uh, actually is and how it's defined and a common definition of it. The flexibility to be able to meet all of the different stakeholders and to speak in their language, to use the pipeline metaphor when that's appropriate. And maybe that's not appropriate the next time you're out and speaking to someone from another sector, but there's a way to make it understandable. I think that's really important. And then the third piece you mentioned at the end, and I don't know if you intended it this way or not, but I think that it's a really good segue for us to talk a little bit about what the sector needs to do. And that is that you mentioned that people were foreclosing an opportunity because the job description doesn't exactly match or doesn't sound exactly the way things are supposed to be or the job that they've been doing. And I think one of the things that's really eye-opening in listening to you and in how you've woven career development and policymaking and impact in you know, sectors as a wider variety as uh, agriculture, coal, energy, transportation, you've given us a, a lot to be able to think about all different policy areas, is how often does the sector foreclose because the presenting opportunity doesn't sound like a career development, uh, education, a training, a skills opportunity? And how can we take the superpowers that we have? Uh, you mentioned one, which is building confidence and helping people know that even in times of change, they've got this. If I'm gonna uh, feedback some of the words that you use, that's a superpower that we have. How often do you see us foreclosing on our own opportunities because it's not something that we recognize we have an ability to be able to really be very useful in and helpful in? And what advice would you give if we're looking to expand our impact and to really understand where that intersection point between career development, skill and background and expertise can actually be something that's a superpower that's needed as organizations and governments are struggling with things like uh, climate change and you know some of the biggest pandemic relief, economic recovery, transportation, you know, you name it. There's there's a whole lot of areas that need a whole lot of good thinking. How can we do a better job of making people aware that we're part of that solution? Well, I I think that uh, you, you touched on something that that I have found is really important. It's it's not about career development. It's about impact. And, and working with others to understand where you've got some shared interests. Now, now what you bring and, and, and what you deliver, yeah, that happens to be career development. But, but what you need to do is, is talk in terms of what your interests are together. 
and and your interest might be career development and, and advancing the the professionalism and, and the, the role of the sector and helping people get even better at, at supporting others but but the interest that society has is is uh, of a higher order maybe the, the common interest that you might have with with peer groups or other stakeholders in the community it's it's uh, economic it's it's uh, quality of life considerations i mean career professionals play in that space we just don't talk in those terms right. and it's really critical that we that we we come back down from from that insistence that it's about us and and actually instead insist that it, it's about us as a bigger community it's not an us and them um the the changes that we're confronting in this can this country and, and all of them that, you know they're really unsettling you look at what's going on in the flooding right now in, in, in dc it's frightening and and we're all of us navigating towards a, a future that is really uncertain you know the the, the plans that you know i mentioned things like mortgages people's livelihoods things that were once something that that you could rely on that felt solid they're being upended you know by by waves of, of global competition of weather events the disruptive technology, the, the changing kind of social expectations around some industries, hard jobs, jo jobs that were once thought of as, as honorable and dignified, they're being vilified right now. And it, it doesn't matter if we're, we're thinking about the, the carbon impact of manufacturing or, or transportation or the, the resource sectors that I mentioned, or, but it's also like the microscope that sees us re-examining the, the the role and behavior of the police and the justice system, yeah. right? Or or the culture in the military, or or the trust that we hold in healthcare, and in science, and in our neighbors, right? In each other. So I mean, they're really tough times. Now I I was lucky once I got to hear Chris Hatfield speak and and uh, the, the astronaut and and i remember him saying competence is the best antidote for the stress and anxiety that we can feel in the face of uncertainty how do we prepare ourselves for what's ahead not shrink or put our head in the sand but actually get a sense of what's what's changing around us and prepare to adapt to be on our toes rather than our heels and, and behave in a way that's more agile and, and, and so I think that that's important for individuals. I think it's important for organizations too, to really know yourself, know what your assets are. You don't need to pretend to be someone else. You gotta be your best self. And it, it makes me think of what the career sector and what career policy can offer. Um, you know, you think about helping young people preparing for multiple job changes during their work life. What kinds of entrepreneurial skills do they need? to hustle their way through those kinds of transitions, you know, in a way that previous generations maybe didn't have that same um, requirement, right? Where the relationship between a worker and employer was very different than it is today. You know, and, and more fundamentally, how do you give them confidence and hope that they've got something to offer a world that's uncertain, where they might be different? I mean, that's, and everybody's different. I mean. I'm, I'm a triplet, but I'm still different from my, my brothers, right? We've all got something. And it's the career professionals that can help to reveal that for people, you know, and give them a sense of hope. And then, you know, you look at, 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 at an industry level though, like let's just take this up and, and how industries need to be transformed. What's their preferred future? The, the practice of having a career conversation, what if we did that at an industry level? That sort of curious engagement, that active listening, that reflecting back, being non-judgmental, non-judgmental. Many people will know what that can mean for an individual relationship and building rapport and credibility. It's not happening very much right now, is it? And, you know, in a, in a really fragmented time. I mean, that so that's kind of what comes to mind is, that you know we've got we've got industries that are, that are changing. It's it's a hyper competitive world, and in in this province, the the share of GDP that's 
that would, could be attributed to something like agriculture, which might be a big part of Saskatchewan's brand, it's been shrinking over time. And, and we've seen a diversification. But with global competition, we've also seen productivity gains. So we might see industries that are diverse and a big share of the economy, but when you actually look at the share of the labor force that they contribute to, you know, um, you're looking for more skilled workers to work on a farm, more sophisticated equipment. The, the way that we manufacture things is changing. You need higher levels of education and, and skill in order to qualify for jobs. And it's just to keep up with the pace of change globally. Career development has that lifelong uh, uh, implication that is necessary uh, for all of us to thrive. And so I think there's a place for it, but I, I don't think it needs to be branded and, and pushed that it's about career development. It, it's about advancing towards a preferred future. And that's what we talk about with clients all the time. Yeah, I really like that. And I think, you know, on joining us is kind of a whole bunch of different audiences. We have career development practitioners, we have policymakers, we have people who are just randomly curious and wanted to know what this is about. I'm sure we have some members of the Alistair McFadden fan club that have joined us. So we have all different people that are joining us and listening from all, all kinds of uh, lenses. I, I hear you're giving away free uh, coffee mugs to all of your fan club members, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> just kidding. But I, you know, I think that so far we've had the discussion really focused from the career development practitioner lens and the perspective from the sector of how we can even just be more aware of the superpowers that we have and the things that we're trained in. I love your comment about, you know, active listening and non-judgmental approaches, especially in challenging times when there's lots of opportunity to be judgmental or to have an opinion, but that's really not, that's, that's not our job and that's not what we're here for. We're here to help chart a path into uncertain futures. Um, and the more that we can realize that that's, you know, that's the role that we play, uh, the more we'll be able to get out of, focusing on ourselves and instead looking at the challenges that need that type of um, that type of approach. Looking at it from the policy side of the house, and you know, you touched on this in an earlier conversation that you and I had had, how aware do you think that uh, people that are within government, policymakers are that there is this opportunity to think things through and to have partners at the table that look at all of these changes from a human lens with a lifelong career trajectory and an ability to map uncertain futures. How, how connected do you think policymakers are to understanding that this is a, you know, just as a critical skill as maybe risk management or project management or some of the other areas that they tap into regularly? I think it varies. There's no doubt in my experience that it varies. You know, I, I had great opportunities to work with people from across the country in you know as a, as a deputy minister or assistant deputy minister or at one point I, I, I managed a branch that did labor market policy I got to work with my peers who were in the federal government or in, in different provinces and territories and then as things progressed I would sit beside the elected and I'd be the one that was was trying to give them that, that non-partisan really objective perspective on the issue that we were talking about you know give them the, the neutral set of options maybe a, a recommendation that's kind of grounded in some really clear criteria, but, but they make the choice. And when it comes to a, a career lens, when you think about the, the breadth of experience for those who end up in politics and, and what kind of career path journey they might have had, what kind of upbringing they might have had, Right? And, and how that flavors the way that they look at, at human services broadly, which to me, incidentally, is uh, a, a way of actually redefining what we do in career development. Um, you know, I happen to think that when you help someone to get a home, you're helping them become more employable. When, when you help them to fulfill their basic needs with an income support or helping them to access childcare or making sure they have the right clothes or that they're safe, you're supporting their employability. But we talk about that as though it's, it's social policy. And yeah, to a certain extent, sure, we're, we're trying to help people because they're people, but we're also helping them to advance, giving them a foundation to, to move forward. 
what I've found is that it's important to show the elected decision makers that career services are good economic policy. Speak in their language. Find out what's important to them. What terminology do they use? What, what key messages do they talk in? And how do you support that? Because if you can speak their language, then you're not giving them the work to try to translate. Right? You've got to make it really easy for them. And, and to be clear, you know, when, when you're doing that, you've you got to make sure that it's, it's not just a conversation that's about jobs or about training for jobs. Those kinds of things come and go. Industries emerge and collapse. That's part of what we've been talking about. Right. What endures, hopefully successfully, are the people, the human capital. And the most visionary leaders, they recognize that. They see people as an asset, you know, not as a cost. They see those human service activities as investments. But for them to actually make that connection, you have to demonstrate the return on that investment. Not just because it's the right thing to do, yeah. but that it actually pays off for the people. It pays off for a bigger agenda. And that's what I was doing in that nonprofit, right? It didn't change or corrupt their mandate or their work. They still really believed in it with their whole heart, right? The full and deep personal commitment to helping young people and adults with disabilities. We just reframed how we told our story and we could show the government and we actually proved to ourselves that the monetary value of those kinds of interventions I, I just, it, it awakens a different kind of conversation and collaboration when you can do that. And I want to push your challenge on the idea that we need to change your language and speak in the language that your, you know, the cohort that you're trying to connect in with is talking in and changing yeah. the story. For me, I, I think it actually has to go deeper than that. That, you know, so often what we see is we see people who at the surface level will do that. They'll translate the language or they'll put something into a, an interesting story at the top of the presentation, but don't actually go deep enough to have the kind of thorough understanding of where their connection points help advance some of the other goals that are already in the initiative. Like it's it's not a, I want to make sure that we're we're leaving the right impression that it's not a communications activity, but it's an actual embedding of value and integrating the value together. Your stories of how you were able to do that wasn't simply because you have good language to use to explain it, but because you know beyond once you got them bought in at the pipeline story, you actually knew where those impact points and levers would be. And you were curious um, to continue to learn more when you got to the edges of what you didn't know. And I'm going to turn it over to you just for a, a final comment in a second, and then we're going to take some of the questions that are coming in. We have a good amount of questions that are coming at us, but I want to tie it back to the Retain and Gain Career Management for Public Sector playbook. One of the reasons why we wanted to include in this version of the playbook, compared to the version that was written for small business or for nonprofits and charities in this public sector edition, we wanted to include a special section called Careers in Canadians where we highlighted where career work can be embedded or is already embedded in work that's being done with Veterans Affairs, with Environment Canada, with areas around the federal, provincial, and municipal governments, you know, within the, the correction system, within transportation. Where is there already things that this lens is already being applied to? We just don't necessarily see it that way. And so how can we not just get past the language difficulty and make sure we're talking each other's language, but really see each other for serving the ultimate purpose, which is to make the transit system more efficient or to improve the way we get off of fossil fuels and onto sustainable uh, environment. I mean, that's the end purpose and the end goal, not just focusing on how can we take this population and find them jobs. So I'll leave that as kind of a, a, an exit comment from me listening to what you've shared with us so far and ask you if you wanna just Close us off with a, a, a final comment, and then I'll take us through some of the questions. Well, uh, thank you for the, the observations, because it ties it up really nicely. It, it isn't just about talking someone's language. And you think about this with the one-on-one -on -one interaction we might do with a client. Starting by, de by developing a bit of rapport, right? the active listening, trying to find a way to speak the same language 
as the individual, not talking down to them, but working with them as, as a supportive uh, ally is the, is the first step to, to co-designing and co-authoring a plan with them, right? And then working with them to execute it and, and touching, touching base to actually talk about the kinds of progress or the, the obstacles that are getting in the way. That, that's the kind of thing that we do in career services, but it's also what happens in public policy. You, you build a, a community and a working alliance. You come up with uh, solutions that are plausible and possible. A decision is made on what will be advanced and, and you make it so, hopefully with a, with a team of allies, hopefully with some consideration for the workforce implications. So that government's aspirations and regulations and legislation, as I said, they can actually be activated by real people on the ground. Right. right. That, that's the that's the work of the, the public sector. And, and I think that it actually shows some real strong parallels to what happens in career services and career development. Great. Well, thank you for the for the conversation so far. When we first met, I shared with you that you know, in my background, my education, I uh, I did a master's in public administration as part of my MBA, and so the, any opportunity to be able to dig in and have these conversations is a treat for me. And I'm sure for everyone else that's been listening, the comments that are within the chat um, and the questions that have been coming in in the Q and A is uh, is is pretty remarkable and covers a very broad spectrum from questions that relate to what individual Canadians need to be doing to all the way up to some uh, some bigger and headier questions. So let's start with one that comes from Lynn. And Lynn asks that, uh, especially with some of the new reports that are out, it's becoming clear that Canadians use career services less than other countries. So the, the the, the people that are actually interacting with career development practitioners is lower than in other countries, even the United States. And estimates are as low as 10% of the population. So in your view, um, what's the point? What's the, to use your question, what's the meaningful takeaway from this one data point from some of the reports? What do you think the sector needs to reflect on given that this is uh, what is being researched and reported, and, and what do others looking at these reports need to consider before we jump to easy conclusions? One thing that comes to mind for me is that, uh, you know, it could be as low as 10% that, that are using services as they are today. And I don't think that's an indictment on the quality of those interventions. It, it perhaps may be a comment on their accessibility. And, and whether it's actually the, the kinds of supports that people believe that they need or that are designed for them. Um, when I think about the way that uh, the service system is, is, exists right now, uh, it's actually not that easy to navigate to get what you need. Um, uh, many of the providers uh, identify with particular demographic groups rather than a particular stage in a person's career, right? So it becomes exclusionary rather than inclusive. You, you have to go to a, a certain location to access those services. It's not clear whether it's uh, for, a, for a cost or if it's, if it's for free. Uh, it's not always brought to the individual that's in need. You have to, you know, you have to make your way there. Those are the things that, that come to mind. I think if, what what could be happening um and and what what is certainly happening right now with with more remote delivery is that we do see a wider audience that could access services assuming they have the technology and assuming that we're able to adapt uh to give them what they need um but uh, principles of of um co-development of those interventions are a good thing and sometimes in what I've seen in, in the interface between governments and service providers is that the service providers don't always have permission to create a, a more responsive model or to create something that's really tailored for the community of need. They're sometimes told by the government, here's what we'll buy. Here's what we want you to deliver. Here's your hours of service. And it, it handcuffs them to a particular mode of, of delivery that really limits um, the full impact that might be possible. And, and that's why I would go back to that relationship between the provider community 
and the government decision makers to talk about what, what result are we trying to achieve? Can we have a, a contract that actually is, is really specific about the impact and is maybe less prescriptive about how that, that result is achieved, right? To enable a bit more innovation in, this, in the system. You know, that was- So you've, you've walked us right into another question, uh, almost as if it was perfectly planned. So Brendan asked this question. So first, uh, they make the comment that they're finding the conversation really interesting and is wondering how to emphasize that exact kind of conversation, the economic importance of something like work purpose or the impact that their agency or community-based service can have, when the discussion and the intersection that they have with policymakers and those that hold those program mandates and agendas is focused on employment numbers. The boxes that they're able to fill in and give information back asks for employment numbers. So what advice would you give Brendan sitting in one of those agencies and wanting to have that conversation that you just said is so critical to solving some of these problems? How does he get the audience that he needs to be able to have that broader conversation? So I, I've, I've been right there being asked to file reports. How, you know, how many clients did you serve? How many went on to further training? How many got jobs? But but we just gave them more information. Now, it, it's got to be packaged in a way that's succinct. It's not a great big report, but it tells them a more fulsome story and, and narrative about the people who are being served, the interventions that are necessary, and the, the, the fuller story, right? Nobody asked us to start doing a cost-benefit analysis. We just knew that we needed to level up. And, and so when it comes to the scorecard that government uses, I mean, we, we would all like to see clients move to jobs. But if, if we've got contracts where the only success measure is employment, imagine what it does to the client who's most distant from employment. They, they're the ones who get neglected. And the service providers feel an incentive to, to only work with the most employable and, and, and leave the ones who actually might, in, in terms of a lifetime cost, have a bigger consequence for government. Right? They're the ones who we actually want to focus on. That's a conversation to have with your government partner. And, and, and find a way to actually document the incremental progress that people make. And eventually work your way to actually monetize that. You know, when a person gets a home, how much closer are they to being employable? I mean, yeah, there's something intuitive about that, but, but, but how much does it matter? Right, that's, we have to start finding a way to talk about and measuring the things that count. So what you're asked for is only the starting point. That's a low bar for a conversation. It all comes back to the, the cab driver advice of what's the point, Yeah. right? And making sure we understand it first and then that we're able to, um, to tell the story. Well, Alistair, the hour has flown by and there are a couple of other questions for those that submitted questions and we didn't have a chance to get to them. Um, they're great questions and what maybe we can do is find another way to be able to answer them or maybe look for our next guest in the next in this series, the next person who will sit down in these fireside chats and uh, make sure that we focus on some of those questions with them. So hopefully you'll uh, you'll come along and join in that uh, in that next session as well. Alistair, from my perspective, I just want to say um, say thank you to you for it's always great to be able to sit and have a, a conversation fireside in the middle of the workday. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that you've given us a lot to not just think about, but actually take action on and really reflect on like what, what can we be doing differently and how does our work have broader impact? So I thank you for that. I, I'm really happy to have an opportunity, even if it is just to remind people of how powerful it can be just to listen to people and, and, and help them talk about what, the, what a preferred future might look like, right? Help them think their way through it. We don't tell, right? we, we reveal. Right. And, and it's, just, it's, a, it's a massive strength of, of a system uh, to see that kind of thing uh, in career services. We need it in more places in public policy. Wonderful, a great reminder.
All right, we are back. Thank you so much, uh, Alistair and Lisa. What a fantastic kickoff to our series. I think you identified so many opportunities for policymakers to apply career thinking within public sector mandates and also provided some very pertinent suggestions for how career development professionals can engage in the public policy process. As mentioned, the Careers in Canadians theme is explored in our new Retain and Gain Career Management for the Public Sector Playbook. If you don't have your copy yet, head to sarek.ca slash public sector. If you prefer a hard copy or ebook, you can purchase it. Or since Sarek very much values making this information as accessible as possible, you can also download a free PDF of the book. And in my introductory comments, I mentioned our Connexus conference, which is happening in January 24th, 26th, 2022, virtually. And there are several sessions that explore further this intersection between career development and public policy, including a rock star panel of global leaders from the UK, Norway, and New Zealand, who will share how they've influenced policy changes in their countries. So please check our Connexus website for more information. A final thank you to everyone who joined us today. Note when you exit the webinar, a brief survey will appear. Please do take a moment to share your feedback on the event today and stay tuned for a further announcement on who Lisa will be interviewing next in the Careers in Canadian series. And with that, I hope you have a lovely rest of your day.